right? A lot of things happening around the world, a lot of things happening in our world right here. Um, signs of Jesus' soon return are everywhere. Wars, rumors of war, wild weather, chaos in Congress. It's a mess <laughs> everywhere we look. Now is the time for us to press together, hold fast to what we know is true. And we need to continue to work because the night is coming. It's nearly here, the time when we will not be able to work anymore. Our text says, do not lay up treasures. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In this stewardship series this morning, I've entitled this sermon, Buried Treasure. Now, when you think of, of talents, what immediately comes to your mind? I would probably guess that you would be thinking about someone who's able to play the piano or a musical instrument, someone who is able to maybe compose music or paint, someone that's able to paint landscapes or draw. Maybe someone has a talent for sculpting. Um, maybe we think about, I have kind of gotten distracted a bit uh, this week with Food Channel. I don't know if any of you <laughs> get involved with the Food Channel, but there are some baking wars that go on. And these people are really, now they have talents. They can take a pumpkin and almost carve anything out of it. They carve whole scenes of things using cookies and cakes. It's really pretty impressive. And I would say that's a talent. Some people might have a talent for sewing garments, or some people might have a talent for building. We admire architects and what they are able, um, what they're able to build. I don't know if you heard this week, but um, they are now, architects are now working on um, computer generated housing. It's all done on computer the materials, everything. They actually make a house um, on the computer for people to live in. So some of us may say, oh, I'm, I'm not talented. I can't do any of those things. I can, really can't sing, okay? I try to keep my voice kind of blended with everyone else. I really don't have any talent for drawing. I can only draw stick figures. I can, I'm just an ordinary person. I don't have any special skills. I really don't have any talents. But you know, this isn't true. This week, as I contemplated talents, I discovered a broader definition, one that transcends what the world sees as a talent. And I think it's going to be kind of surprising to you some of the talents that I was able to find. And they're really they're treasures. Talents are, are actually treasures that God has entrusted to us to use for his honor and his glory. Now, there's something interesting about uh, treasures, especially earthly treasures. We have to be careful because there are those little things, those pesky moths. And moths are really annoying, aren't they? They feed on natural fabrics like leather and wool and silk. They will even eat through your dresser. They love wood. They will even eat through your dresser. And because they're so small, you won't notice their presence until it's just about too late. They also can get into your pantry and they like to get into your oatmeal and your other grains. They really like to get into your flour and they like to eat they like to eat that, and they can really be destructive. 
Another thing that it talks about here is rust in our, um, in our scripture. Rust is a destructive chemical process and it, it results in corrosion. It's a chemical reaction. It can cause metals to discolor. It can cause them to lose their gloss and often it can cause them literally to fall apart. And thieves that are mentioned in our text, well, we all know what thieves are. They break in when we least expect it. And they take things that we feel we have worked very hard for. And we don't like that very much. No one likes a thief. Okay, we feel that that isn't fair. Well, Jesus talked about in his time um, some talents. And it's not quite the talents that I'm going to be talking about today, but you remember a parable in the New Testament. Um, it's in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. We're not going to read that whole thing, but um, I just want to remind you of what it is. A master has three servants, and the master is going away. The first servant he gives 10 talents to. Now, in biblical times, a talent was an ancient weight, or it was money. It was currency. So to the first servant, the master gives 10 talents. To the second one, he gives five. And to the third one, he gives one. And he goes away on his business trip. And when he returns, he calls his servants to him. And he wants to know, he wants them to give an account. What have you done while I was gone? And the one that he gave 10 talents came to him. It's, oh, master, I have doubled what you gave me. Oh, that's very good. Okay, the second servant that was given five, I have doubled, master, what you gave me. Well done. The third servant, however, that got one talent came and said, oh, I know how hard of a master you are. So I protected, I buried the talent that you gave to me. Um, I still have just the one that you gave me, but it's safe, and I buried it. Now, we learn from this parable that we should not bury our God-given resources, our talents, but we should use them to multiply for God's glory. But how do we do this? How do we lay up treasures in heaven? What exactly does that mean? And I grappled with that a little bit. What does that mean? I even called my brother. I called in, you know how the TV show, you can call in a, a resource? I tried calling in a resource and that didn't help too much. And I had to go back to the Bible in the spirit of prophecy to kind of look at what does it exactly mean to lay up your treasures? in heaven. Well, it's interesting because where your, where your heart is, is where your treasure is going to be. So where are our hearts today? I found it was very interesting that I don't know, this one was a hard one for me to, to really wrap my mind around. Maybe you can you can help me continue to wrap my mind around it. Property is a talent. Property is a talent. And I thought that is really strange. How is property, how is property a talent? Well, all that we have and all that we own belongs to who? Belongs to God. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17 says that by, by him and for him were all things created in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whatever they may be, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Hmm.
And then I do want you to turn with me to a parable in the book of Luke. You can open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Property. The book of Luke, I thought, how is property a talent? I didn't understand this. But then I came across this parable. It's in Luke 12, and it's verses 13 to 21. In my Bible, the subheading is the parable of the rich fool. Then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build <laughs> greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool this night your soul will be required of you then whose will these things be when you which you have provided so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward god are we sharing the property that we have the things that we have do we maybe have multiples of things that are in our house? I know that I do. I know that I do. We generally have more than we need. And instead of keeping it for ourselves, it is a talent to be able to look around and see a need and fulfill it with something that we have. If we pray and we ask God to put us in just the right place at the right time, he will do it. And there will be someone that we can help. Now, we can put our property to good use in the cause of God and souls for his kingdom by meeting very immediate needs that people have. Now, <laughs> This rich man who had many crops, if his heart had been oriented toward God, he probably wouldn't have been as concerned about building a bigger barn to stockpile everything that he had, but he might have donated it or sold it for the benefit of the community, those that are around him. Um, he might have followed Jesus's instructions to his disciples. In Luke 12, 33 to 34, Jesus said, sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mark 8.36 says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? If you have lands and property, if you have things and you're using them just for yourself, you're burying what could be good, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. This man's heart was in his earthly treasures, not in loving God and others. Because the earth is temporary, our wealth is temporary. 
we should invest our treasures in something that is more lasting, and that is for heaven, helping a soul. The second thing that I discovered was a talent is strength. Well, generally, we don't think of strength as a talent, but strength is a talent that is given to us to be used for God's glory. So how can we lay up a treasure of strength in heaven? How can we do that? I didn't really understand what does that mean? What does it mean to lay up strength in heaven? How is strength a talent? Well, the Bible tells us that we should um, love God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. That is in Mark 12, 30. Again, in Luke 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. If you have strength, if you have the energy to work in God's cause, we should. We should do that. The Gospel of Mark also uses the word strength to mean ability. Now, God has given each one of us gifts, talents, and abilities, and in our use of those, um, we can either commit our energy to glorify ourselves, or we can commit this treasure, this gift, to glorify God. How are we using our strength today? Sometimes our strength, um, which is a treasure, is eaten away by the cares of the world. I remember years ago um, working at the Battle Creek Adventist Hospital. And I was working as um, a psychiatric mental health tech. And sometimes I would be asked to work a double shift. Now, those of you that work in healthcare or any related field, you know that working a double shift is not the easiest thing to do. And I had a hard time staying awake. But I did have a friend who not only did double shifts, he volunteered for triple shifts. He, he just stayed around the clock. And I said, aren't you exhausted? And he said, well, look, he said, he said I, I'm going to do it because there is a refrigerator that I want to buy and there's a TV that I want to buy. And he says, if I work enough of these shifts, I'm going to be able to go and buy it cash. So he said, I'm just going to do it. Well, needless to say, his strength was so zapped what happened on Sabbath? He was exhausted. He was just absolutely exhausted. He could not stay awake. I have seen people that have worked double and triple shifts at that hospital who actually fell asleep sitting up front. They were exhausted. Their strength was eaten away by trying to amass treasures from this world that will not last. We work and we work and we work to have things and then we are just too tired for the best things. Invest your strength in heaven, not in things <laughs> that will you, 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 can't, you can't take things with you to heaven. Invest your strength, whatever strength you have, in laying up a treasure in heaven. If you don't use muscles, they atrophy. And what isn't used that's materialistically will begin to rust. I remember that um, when Ephraim and I were first married, we lived with um, my cousin. And they had purchased a grill and put it down in their basement. It was still in the box. I don't know how long they had had that grill, 
But Everett and I got the idea that we wanted to do a little bit of grilling. We were going to throw some things on the grill and Ephraim went down and he told Maria, listen, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put the grill together out of the box. Well, he opened the box, the receipt was still in it. You couldn't really see it, it was all faded. And as he took the parts of the grill out of the box to put them together, guess what? Exactly, they were rusted. It had actually rusted in the box. They had had it that long. No, that is not good. We must use the strength that we have to lay up treasures. Use your strength to help others. Use your, whatever strength you have to do what you can for others. God has promised us that he, if we dedicate our strength to the kingdom of heaven, that he will help us. He says those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is our refuge and he is our strength. And it is a gift from him if you have strength. Use it for him. Are we taking every opportunity that we can? To use what strength we have and not give God what's left over from our <laughs> when our energies are gone, put him first. The third one that I found, speech is a talent. Speech is a talent. Of, of all the gifts bestowed on the human family, none should be more appreciated than the gift of speech. It is to be used to declare God's wisdom and his wondrous love. Thus, the treasures of his grace and wisdom are to be communicated. It is a talent to be able to speak to others about what God has done for you, to speak to others about his love and his grace. Are we taking every opportunity that we can to speak to others about God's love? Are we speaking hope and peace to people in a world that is falling apart, it's falling apart all around us. Are we speaking hope and peace? It's a talent to be able to strike up a conversation with those we meet. Whether you're in Kroger at the checkout line and you're saying hello to the person who's scanning your groceries across, or whether you're at the gas station filling up and you speak to the person who's behind that glass, <laughs> the screen as you pay, um, what about in your own family? What is your speech like? Speech is a, it, it's a talent, okay? Um, God will put us in the right place at the right time to be, to be able to speak for him. Proverbs 25, 11, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And Proverbs 15, 1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I think I should maybe send this, email this to maybe a few people here and there. A soft answer turns away wrath. There's a lot of, there's a lot of wrath. There's a lot of anger in our world today. And speech, if you have the gift, of speech, it is a talent. An indwelling savior is revealed by the words. The Lord desires those connected with his work to speak at all times with the meekness of Christ. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That means even when you're cut off in traffic, be careful of <laughs> what words come out of your mouth. And the last one that I want to share with you this morning is influence is a talent. Influence is a talent. Influence is the ability to have a positive impact on other people. It is a power for good when the sacred fire of God's indwelling Holy Spirit is brought 
into service. And the Holy Spirit is using us to influence someone else for good. It's God, the Holy Spirit is like God's kindling, okay? Um, burning brightly, hopefully it's burning brightly in us as we're brought into contact with others, coworkers, neighbors, strangers, anyone really. Hebrews 10.24 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. A godly influencer is one who moves others toward God's agenda. Before we can influence others though, toward godliness, we ourselves must be under God's influence. We must be under God's influence. If we are moving steadily and consistently toward God, be assured there is someone watching. People are watching. They watch what you do. They listen to what you say. You can be an influencer. For Christ. Jesus is our example. How did he influence people? He testified to the truth. He said, it is written. It is written. He used influence rather than authority to urge his disciples toward a common goal. He influences us today as his disciples through education and personal Example, look at the life of John and Andrew. They became influencers sharing the good news that the Messiah had come. They were out and the word of Jesus quickly spread to many others, including um, Andrew and Peter. Look at Paul and Silas. They were in prison, in chains. They became influencers. <laughs> they influenced the jailer to believe in Christ. They were singing while they were in change. They were mighty influencers. We are all called to be an influence for God. I'm gonna end with a brief story that I wanna share with you. It's from uh, the little devotional book, The Promises of God by HMS Richards. It was 1855, and a Bible colporteur went to Toulon, France, and he sold some copies of the New Testament to soldiers who were on their way to the Crimean War. One soldier asked, what are you selling there? The colporteur said, oh, I'm selling um, a New Testament. It's the word of God. <laughs> the soldier said, let me have it. He laughed. And he said, now it will do very well to light my pipe. The coal porter was dismayed. He felt bad. And he thought, well, that's going to be a wasted New Testament <laughs> right there. He's going to use it to light his pipe. A year later, the coal porter was working in central France. And he went to stay the night in an inn. There he found that the family in charge of the inn were in mourning. They were in great distress. And he said, what, what has happened? What is wrong? And they said, well, our son has died. He has just died. He'd been wounded in, in the Crimean War, and he'd come home so that he could die here at home. And we just already miss him so much. But then the mother told the call porter something kind of strange. He, she said, but we have great consolation in this moment because our son was so peaceful and so happy. Happy? How, how was your son happy? Asked the call porter. Well, the woman said, her son told them that he found all his comfort in one little book that he always carried with him. The coal porter asked, well, may I see it? They went and they brought it. It was a copy of the New Testament. 
the last 20 pages had been torn out. But on the inside of the cover were these words, received at Toulon, and it had the date. Despised, neglected, read, believed, and found salvation. The Cole Porter recognized the place and the date. He was the one who had sold that New Testament to that soldier. All our acts, our words, and our thoughts will return to us at some time. We know that there may be people in heaven that are there because of you. Your influence, something that you have done to help them, they will be there. And they will come up and say, do you remember me? You helped me one day. Time may seem to carry away the fruit of your labor. Sometimes we don't see immediate results to our influence or what we try and do for the Lord. But don't despair. And don't stop casting your bread on the waters and laying up treasures in heaven. Put your hearts into the Lord's service. Give your energy, your enthusiasm, your time, your treasure, and your love to him. God is going to watch over it. And the day will come when he declares, we want to hear these words from him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord.